waiting for. I'm going to talk again. And, but that's not the real moment. So the real moment, of course, guys, uh, Bob is one of our very favorite people. So Bob, uh, he's an avid field herper, uh, as a lot of us are. But Bob kind of takes it to some different levels. So he really combines the skill of understanding habitat, understanding the outdoor stuff, understanding the animal, having patience with the animal, uh, and then his photography skills are just kind of like off, you know, off the charts. And so he combines all of that, and then he really has a love and a passion for conservation. Um, and, and some of that is even reflected in his calendar sales. He might talk about how much money he's donated to conservation through the calendar sales. Um, but so he's, he's a person who has, has these really cool ideas, like we all have cool ideas, but then he really works hard and brings them to fruition. So we're really happy to have him here, and he's just going to be sharing some stories of some of his awesome adventures. Um, so if you have not experienced jealousy lately, get ready to experience it. But you see all the awesome places that he's been, but he works very hard to achieve all this. So we really appreciate him coming and sharing some of this with us. So please welcome Bob Ferguson. Thanks, Jesse. Um, first, I just want to give a few quick disclaimers before I start. Okay. Um, any photos of Julie are not representative of her normal state of affairs, <laughs> meaning her hair. <laughs> Multiple days in the rainforest and humidity can wreak havoc on one's normal appearance without the comforts of home. <laughs> ye shall not judge, lest ye be judged yourself. <laughs> and um, a few more things. I have one picture of my teenage stepdaughter in here. Please don't let it leave here because I probably won't ever be back. Um, and like Jesse said, I kind of pride myself on my photos. I try to take seven decent photos, but I, I have mixed a lot of cell phone, cell phone photos and like kind of crappy photos into this to kind of tell the story. So um, real quick, that, has anybody here been to the Neotropics? Jesse, where have you been? Just Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Anybody else? Like Mexico down? Guatemala. You've been to Guatemala? What exactly is the Neotropics? Neotropics is kind of like the tropical zone from like Mexico. I don't know how far into South America it goes, but it's, it's, be, it's between, you know, the tropical longitude, I guess. So Neotropics is really just the new world tropics. The actual tropics are in the old world, like uh, Asia, that type of thing. So that side of the world. So I might say tropics or tropical, I mean down below us, south of us. So basically when I was trying to come up with um, a way to present these last few trips I took, I, I came up with the 10 lessons I've learned in the trips that I've taken. And uh, real quickly, I um, went to Honduras with Julie back in last July. That was my first foray into the Neotropics. And then I went to Panama by myself for five days in January. And then, I, I mean, I fell in love with it from the second I arrived in Honduras, and I knew that I had to take my family there. So we have five kids in between us. We have a, a mixed family. So this last summer, we took all five kids with us. So all seven of us went down to Costa Rica. We spent four nights in two different areas of Costa Rica. So that's what I'm drawing from here. I have those three trips. I've stayed in five different areas. And I guess it's my hopes to, if not many of you have been there, to kind of inspire you to go there. Uh, because it's something that really should not be missed if, you, if you're a herp enthusiast. So I'm just going to get started. And I apologize, I might be a little rough with the PowerPoint here. I don't do much public speaking, so please bear with me. So lesson number one, it's not that easy. <laughs> All right, this works. Okay, um, when I was told, when you know, just coming up, thinking about Costa Rica as a teenager, I would think, oh my God, it's, you go down there, you're going to see all these crazy herps, and it's, there's going to be dripping snakes everywhere you look. When I got down there, I realized it's not that easy. I find easily more, I can find more snakes in the Poconos in one day than I can in a whole week down in the down in the Neotropics. It's, I think the problem is everything there can be anywhere. So I, I got a few of these habitat pictures. I mean, you can have things on a trail. You can have things at knee height in the bushes. You can have things 20 feet up. So you're real. I mean, there's just there's so many places these animals can be, and you're probably walking by dozens. 
And it, it, that was, that was um, a surprise to me. Here's another picture of some habitat and lovely Julie. I wanted to include this. This is like in the middle of the rainforest. I wanted to include this. I'm trying to uh, give you some tips here. Whenever you see something like this, like they have some old trails through uh, the forest and stuff when you're going to like management areas and parks, stick to these because snakes, at least terrestrial snakes, will use them like drift fences and you can really um, pad your numbers by following along these things and just looking, you get, you get toads that get stuck in them and they'll just hop along forever. So that really will help you instead of walking around aimlessly. And you can pick up a few herbs like that. One of the herbs I found that way was a red coffee snake. Mm. Um, you find these basically everywhere. They're one of the most common snakes I came across in all three countries. And they look a little different uh, from country to country, but this is probably the best looking version of one. That, that was a Honduras individual. Like I said, the toads get stuck. I mean, you can find them anywhere, but they get stuck in those, those little you know, paths with the, with the raised sides. And here's a cell phone picture. I told you I'd add some <laughs> crap shots. But just if you're not familiar with marine toads, they're huge. Wow. These guys were actually at a bug light setup wow. where they would have all the moths coming in. And at like 3 AM, they're just sitting there picking off bug after bug on a white sheet as they're shining UV <laughs> lights on them. So that was kind of neat. When you're down there, uh, water is your friend. It's hot. It's humid. Uh, if you're going during the dry season, stick close to water, stick close to streams. This is just a habitat shot. Um, other than that, when you're going in the rainy season, you can find things anywhere. Rain, rain is definitely your friend down there. And when I was first told about the rainy season, I was kind of like iffy, like I don't want to go down there and just be rained on the whole time. But it's really not that way. It's like, I don't know if I've, any of you have ever been to Florida, but like, in the summer, they'll have like a thunderstorm every day. It's kind of like that. It's on and off you every single day. We, we were down there in the heart of rainy season in Costa Rica for nine days. Every single day it rained, but every single day we had dryness and sun too. So keep that in mind. Number two lesson, um, and this is an important one, and it's something that you kind of have to check your ego at the door for, at least I did, um, because apparently I'm a legend. <laughs> <laughs> Splurge for a guide. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something we don't ever think about up here because, you know, frankly, if I wanted to start, you know, my own guide service of the Pine Barrens or the Poconos, you know, people be coming after me with, with pitchforks. But down there, it's okay. I mean, uh, make some contacts, find a guide. Uh, it's, it's great. I, I didn't use a guide all the time. My, my plan of attack was every time I went down, I would get a guide for the first night. I can pick their brain for a few hours, they can show me some good spots, they can, you know, they give me all these little secrets, and then I can just apply it to the rest of my trip. Another thing with these guides down there is, as you can see, this guy's name is Mario, he was in uh, Panama. They're just like, they're like renting a herping friend for the night. They're into it as much as I am, you know, and actually I've made some good friends, friendships with them, and we keep in touch, you know, on Facebook or whatever. So. I wanted to share some of the animals that I would not have seen without a guide. Our one guide uh, took us to, it's called Caios Conchinos, or the Hog Islands, and the pet trade, they have Hog Island boa constrictors. And um, we were walking around these woods on this gorgeous island with these turquoise waters, finding these Hog Island boas, one after the other, getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. But I mean, it was just, it was, it was so easy. I never in a million years would have seen any of those without a guide. Um, a guide didn't take me to this one, but he gave me a tip, and I checked it out during the day and found this gorgeous eyelash pit viper in Panama, up on the side of the hill. And actually, this was a birding guide. There was one of these, yes? Um, I just want to point out, that picture is in the calendar, which is for sale today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you all about the calendar at the end. Um, but I, I actually had taken a birding tour and um, he had said, you know, in this tree, there was one tree where there's all these birds, all, all these tanagers, and he said, you know, we usually find pit vipers in here. And I didn't see one that morning. I went back the next morning and found this one and repositioned them. Another snake that a guy had helped us with was a brown vine snake. I actually found this one on my own. That said, I never would have taken the trail without him, and he did say, check, you know, the tops of these branches. I find uh, oxybellus laying there every now and then. 
This was one of my favorite guys from um, Honduras, Joel. I still, he actually just messaged me the other day. This was after a rainy night in Honduras with a Miserana we had found and actually carried about a mile down the hill because the owner wanted to see it. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite, favorite herps about the tropics are the salamanders. And they don't have many down there. But we definitely whoop them in salamanders up here, so don't take it for granted. <laughs> but they have a, these, these Bolito glossa, these climbing salamanders. Mm -hmm. And if you see their little pad feet, I mean, there's really nothing cuter in the herp world, if you ask me. <laughs> Um, they're just such awesome snakes, and you find them walking around at night because you're never going to find them during the day. And I guess you could get lucky flipping them under something, but you find them at night when it's wet or humid, uh, just climbing. And I found I found maybe eight now, and I've seen them this low. I've seen them this high. Um, this was another one on that same trail that night. That this is a wake salamander. That's exactly how I found him. I didn't oh. I didn't pose him or anything. He's just hanging out on a branch. I don't know what he was doing, but he was just hanging there. Um, I'd like to claim responsibility for this snake, but a guide led me to this. This is probably the best looking snake I've ever found. Um, this gorgeous calico snake, completely harmless. That was a Honduras, Honduran snake. Uh, one of the neat things too about being in the tropics is their mammal diversity is unreal and it's pretty easy to come across this stuff. Julie and I were laying out by the pool, I think maybe the last day in Honduras, so we'd been there like four or five days. I'm like, she had finally like coerced me to actually spend some family time. <laughs> so I spent like an hour or two at the pool, and while we were sitting there and I, we're drinking our drinks, Joel, the guy, comes up, he's like, hey, Bob, you want to see a mix? I'm not going to even try to do the, the uh, I'll just stop there. Um, he's like, you want to see a Mexican porcupine? A villager brought it up, because so, they, they usually they'll like kill them but they actually bring them up to this, this lodge and let things go and they pay them a few bucks or whatever. And um, this thing was awesome. I would never seen anything like that. And without, without a guide, you know, without hiring him the first night, he would have never came and found me. This was probably one of our top five finds from Costa Rica, the splendid leaf frog. Uh, we were out with a guide, awesome guy, Miguel, I think, Jesse recommended him to me. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah. The guy, was he the guy missing part of his arm from the uh, bite? I don't think he showed us that. He was like, uh, like a middle-aged guy. Well, Hispanic, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> 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 <That's sad. laughs> um, he took us on this awesome, awesome trail down by Arenal the volcano, and apparently, this frog. I'm not going to say it was a range extension, but it's not published from the area. Nice. I mean, I'm sure people have found them, but it's not making it into the books yet. So it was completely off my radar. It was like one of these things where I'm like, okay, well, I can't cover every spot in Costa Rica. When I go back down, I'll go to La Selva and I'll look for this, you know. So when it showed up, I, we were blown away. Um, this is probably the only rain frog I'm going to include because rain frogs are numerous. Um, there's just dozens and dozens of species, and it doesn't matter how much studying you do, you're going to need the help of some, from somebody who's schooled in it. This broadheaded rain frog, he was hopping around on one of his trails he sent us on. Uh, Yellow-headed gecko, I struck out on this guy in Panama. I actually saw him, and he tucked under some concrete. So without a guy who walked me like five miles up this mountain to some base camp they had up there where... You couldn't drink the water and all. This guy was on a, on a wall up there, so that was great. Another one that was led, that we were led to, this banded snail eater. These guys would climb around the vegetation at night. Like, I can't even imagine something this colorful, you know, climbing around trees up here. So, think about it, guys. It, it's life changing to get down there. Mm -hmm. White bellied stream frog, another really rare find that we had on one of the trails. This next snake, I was told, was the best find I've had down in Costa Rica, and I think I totaled like 66 species or something like that, which just goes to show, because it wasn't a herping trip, this was a family trip, and sure we went out herping, but it was not like herping 24 hours a day, right? <laughs> I did stop to eat, was this uh, Rugo slitter snake. Um, very unique snake, um, rarely found. I'm not going to say it's a rare animal, I just think it's uncommonly found. 
So that was cool. That was in the pouring rain on this mountainside. I actually thought it was dead. It was just laying there. And we had actually, we were walking, and it's dark, and it's pouring, and our lights aren't doing anything. And the army ants are just tearing us up. And I see this thing laying there. Meanwhile, army ants are coming up my legs and just ripping me up. And they're no joke. And this thing's just laying there. And I'm thinking, all right, well, the army ants got it. It's dead. And I kind of like poked it. And it just kind of twitched. And apparently that's what they do. They just lay still and hope you go away. They don't try to get away or anything. So that was kind of neat. One of my top targets down in Costa Rica were, were poison dart frogs. And one of the ones that was going to be the hardest was a granular one. And without that guide in Costa Rica that took me that five miles up that mountain, we would not have found that. So I'm very thankful for guides. Uh, and, you know, don't, don't blow it off if you go down there. Find a good guide, take advantage of them. It's, you know, it's cheap. It's, you know, money goes a lot longer, a lot further down there with these guys. And they're very appreciative and they're all awesome guys. Um, lesson number three. The night time is the right time. The night time is the right time. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, the night time is the right time. I forgot this was family event. I'm very surprised. Um, whenever I come back from a trip and I'm posting photos, I get I get a lot of you know private messages and I get a, I get a lot of comments that say. Something to the effect of like, oh, when I was down in Costa Rica, we didn't see any snakes, or we only saw one snake. And I don't think people get that everything, almost everything down there is nocturnal. I mean, there are certain targets that are terrestrial during the day or whatever, but the majority of everything, including snakes, is nocturnal down there. If you want to find snakes, you've got to be willing to stay up late. If you're going to do it hardcore, I know people, I can't do it with the family, but I know people who go down there to find snakes, they sleep during the day. They go out at dusk, they come back at dawn and sleep and then hang out by the pool in the afternoon and start over again. <laughs> That's the way to do it down there. So, I mean, the majority of the snakes I found down there are during the night. This was a, um, a temporal snail eater. This actually doesn't have a species name yet, so that, that name might change. That was a mm -hmm. snake I found in a cloud forest in Panama, uh, probably about 2.30 in the morning. Of course, frogs are easy at night, but this was a rare one. This is an endemic to Honduras, a Honduran brook frog. Uh, only found a very small pocket in Honduras, so I was very lucky to see that. Again, a uh, common dwarf salamander, another Belita glossa, climbing salamander. Uh, you know, a little more dull than the other versions, but I promise you I have a better looking one coming. One of the neat things about being down there at night is all of the lizards that can basically run 150 miles per hour away from you, you can just walk around and you see a, an iguana or a basilisk or whatever sitting on a branch, walk up to it, pluck it right off. They're just sleeping. So it's a really great way to get a good look at these lizards that are basically usually just like a blur. Um, and the kids love it. The kids just love going down. I'm like, all right, guys, leave that one alone. Leave, leave that one alone. I gotta pick up every one. <laughs> uh, here's a helmeted iguana. Even you can find even uh, sleeping anoles. This is a stream anole, and actually below that fern is a stream. It was right on top of a stream, just sleeping there. Mm. Uh, I included this picture because uh, there's a, there's some really great insects. But the one that, that what, what was neat about this one is if you look, that's actually a tail of an iguana that it's laying on, or hanging, clinging on to. Uh, perp fans are usually fans of, you, you know, the, the weirder outlying <laughs> animals. So nighttime is a great time to find some crazy arachnids and insects, and there's just scorpions and tarantulas just running around like nothing. I mean, we were walking up a trail uh, up like there was a big stream this way, so we had to like kind of be careful. And we're walking up, and I see a tarantula because I've got my eyes on the ground looking for snakes. And I go to step over it, and I almost step on a second one. I mean, they can be pretty numerous in spots. Tons of tree frogs down there. You're not going to find well. You're mainly not going to find tree frogs unless you're looking at night. An icon of the neotropics, a red-eyed leaf frog. A lot of people call it a red-eyed tree frog, which is whatever. I'm not going to, you know, <laughs> bust your chops about it. But 
This is something I dreamed about as a kid, finding. You go down to the tropics, if you have a pond of water, it, they are simple. They, I found them in all three countries I went to, simple. And if you know their call, which you expect to be something cool because they're so cool, it's just like this little click, it's kind of, it's kind of just does not match the caliber of her. They're simple, you can just track them down like it's a gray eye, or a gray eye, a gray tree frog up here. Another gorgeous um, tree frog, this was a, a Panama frog, red web tree frog, that was found right outside of my uh, lodge, which I'll actually show you in a little bit. Hourglass tree frog, I mean these things are just absolutely stunning and they're everywhere. I mean they're simple, this does not take some pro herper to go down there. I mean, these are right outside your hotel rooms. If there's a water feature, you're gonna go find stuff that you, you know, only seen in, in books. This was really cool. This green climbing cove was calling. Um, this was on a night with a guy named Quetzal Dwyer. He actually owns the largest reptile house in all of Costa Rica. He's a transplant from actually Brooklyn, I believe. He was taking us on a... Um, Wait, what's his name? Quetzal Dwyer. Okay. Oh, I called him Quetzal, I think. Is yeah. his wife Monica? I don't know his wife, but I did ask him how to pronounce his name. Oh, I he said Quetzal. Yeah. I've been calling him Quetzal for yeah. years. <laughs> well, after I called him Quetzal a few times, I'm yeah. like, wait, I don't want this guy to think I'm like, you know, rhyming with pretzel or anything. So yeah. I asked him and he said it's Quetzal. So anyway, we, see, we didn't see this frog at first. There's a puddle and it's raining. We see a snake, both me and Quetzal die for it. And this is a story I probably shouldn't share. I won't, I won't share the exact <laughs> details. Long story short, it's a fair to lands. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was hunting these frogs in the water, and thankfully, neither of us grabbed the fair to lands. <laughs> and, um, when I get to a picture of a fair to lands, I'll explain a little bit more about them for those who don't know their demeanor. Mm -hmm. uh, Massive tree frogs everywhere, easy. I mean, everywhere, on the roads, by the water. They're just simple. I mean, this is a good looking individual, don't get me wrong, but simple stuff. This was one of the neatest, um, most unexpected finds down there that night with Quetzal. It was, I've never heard in such conditions. It was an absolute downpour for like only like 45, 50 minutes, but it was like you might as well have been stuck in a hurricane. And we had four Sicilians, I got purple in quotes because somebody told me it's not a purple and they got to figure out the species and all. But I thought it was a purple Sicilian. We saw four of these on the ground. It was something that was off my radar when I went down there and I was really happy to see. Bob, they, could you explain the Sicilians? Because they are very odd. Uh, I don't know much about them. I know they're amphibians. They're, um, they're worm eaters. They look like giant worms. Uh, when I held them, I expected them to be really slippery and get out of my grasp. It will, I was surprised to see that they were actually pretty easy to hold. They didn't put up much of a fight. I think if they wanted to get out, they probably could have. Um, I should have. I should have included a. a I have a close-up picture of their face. They're actually kind of cute. They have these little beady eyes and these like smiling-looking faces. Yes. And that is the face, not that. <laughs> um, so. I'll show you. This is um, my son. If you can see, it's, it's wrapping around his, his hand and the head's by his, his middle finger there. So, I don't know, maybe a foot? And that's about an adult? Yeah, I think so, because all four that we found were like the same exact size. I can't, I, I'm not definite. Mm -hmm. So, that's something, I mean, I'll... I'll Tell you go down there and find tree frogs easy. That's something I think you ought to get really lucky for, and we were really fortunate enough to have the white red, white, right weather conditions. Uh, one of my favorite snakes, also happens to be one of the most common, is a blunt-headed tree snake. These things are just so cool. They're lizard eaters. They climb around the vegetation at night looking for sleeping lizards and take them down. I don't know what else they eat, but they're just so skinny with these big bulging eyes and heads, and you wonder how they can even take down these things. And you hold them, and they're calm, they don't musk, they don't bite, they're just, they're really cool snakes. And, I mean, you walk around for a few hours at night, shining, and once you got a search image going, you can find four or five of these in a night. Yeah. Could you talk about that wire fence that was everywhere, and how often you use that for herping? 
every time I saw a barbed wire, I checked it. Um, I saw, I haven't seen many snakes, maybe three on it, but I mean, they use it. They use it and they just, it's, I guess it's an easy path for them just to move along. Um, I saw a snail leader on one, I think two blind-headed tree snakes, but yeah. yeah that's, that, what we, that's what we found, it was the blood-headed tree snakes and eyelash vipers. Oh, you got an eyelash on that, that's really cool. That's, that's a good pro tip there, check the barbed wire fences at night. Uh, here's me not looking my best because it was raining. <laughs> I don't know what that face is about, but that's a, that's a larger blind-headed tree snake. They can actually get to like four feet. Um, really cool snakes, but you can see how it kind of holds itself, you know, and it can just extend out so far, like maybe two-thirds of its body length to climb. Uh, this is on one night with my kids. They actually found one not up in vegetation. I think Wesley found it moving along the ground, so they're all checking it out. I think that might have been their lifer. Uh, the most common snake we came across in Costa Rica were cloudy snail eaters. Mm -hmm. I probably saw 11 live ones and probably double that dead on the road. We hiked them, we shined them in, uh, in vegetation, we cruised a ton of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't even try cruising. We came back from dinner one night and cruised mm -hmm. what, like three or four snakes on a 20 minute ride <laughs> and three of them were cloudy snail eaters. I think the other one was a coffee snake. Uh, this is one I had, it was just me and Lily. We went out till like 4 a.m. one morning and she slept. Most of the time, but when we found something, I'd wake her up. <laughs> um, some extra tips here. You want a Wi-Fi signal down there unless you want to get lost and not find your way back because the, the roads are crazy and windy. And I don't want to push stimulants, but five-hour energy <laughs> definitely helps when you're staying out till all hours of the morning. Here's my son Nate with his first cloudy snail eater. Every kid found a cloudy snail snail eater. It was like Oprah giving them away. <laughs> Wes was his. Uh, some more nighttime stuff. Like I said, we you could just cruise. You know, just you could cruise frogs. Like cruise them up here, mask tree frogs. We cruise some marine toes. Here's Lily with a splendid leaf frog. I just throwing some pictures in there to show kind of the experience. Um, Here's a little secret I'm going to give away, which I'm glad to actually have a shot at telling you about. We cruise this pretty nice Fairlands uh, dead. It's not just hanging out in the back of my <laughs> van. But, you know, you see so many snakes, you kind of be uh, dead on the road, you kind of become numb to it. I mean, it's, you know, it's unfortunate. That said, that one was going back with me to the hotel because I love to take uh, detailed scale shots, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to try it with a fair lens. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there's, you know, that's my secret there. I did not get one foot away from a fair lens, and I guess I'll use this opportunity to talk a little bit about them. Uh, down there, they call them Terciopello. I think it's Balthrops Asper. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, fair lens, if, if anybody's ever had any experience with black racers, I'm sure most of you have, uh, fair lens have the demeanor of a black racer. Mm -hmm. uh, they're fast, they want to get away, but if they feel cornered or threatened, they're as defensive and nervous as a black racer and as fast. And they'll rot your leg off from the knee down if you get bit, or kill you. Um, they're actually the cause of the most, most deaths down in Central America because they're so common, and they are common, I found a bunch of them. Uh, they, they're very, um, they just, they use all habitats, they're around peoples, you know, where they're living in their communities and stuff, and they're defensive. So, I don't take chances with fair lands, I just don't. So yes, that is a dead one, I apologize. But, it's good for looking at the uh, detail. Another one we shined a lot of at night, northern cat eyed snakes, which are really cool. That was my first one in Costa Rica, I think we ended up finding like six or seven of them. Rebecca, my uh, stepdaughter, actually found a fair lance on a road we were hiking, and that, that was good because she got to be into it. Yes? By showing, do you mean looking for the eye reflections, or? Actually, you don't see eye reflections on snakes. I think the one snake down here, there you can see eye reflection on are tree boas, mm -hmm. which are kind of like in the mangroves, and I tried, I just failed. It was the end of the trip, and honestly, I was kind of really short on sleep and probably just didn't do too well. 
Yeah, I just shine. I just what's great about snakes in the trees is their bellies are usually a different color. That's how I find rough greens around here, um, hmm. or in the pine barrens. You know, they're green and they mix in with that briar perfectly. You gotta get really lucky to see them during the day, but their bellies are white or cream, and you shine it, and at night they stick out like a sore thumb. Hmm. So, kind of same thing down down there. That's what I'm talking about. When I say shine. So, okay. um, this one. It, it was funny. It's one of those times where you're just, you're right. And I said to the kids, I said, let's go, let's go cruise an eyelash viper. And we picked this road and we cruise an Oropel, a golden oh, no. eyelash viper. Um, so there's my kids. I would like to uh, point out that when you're cruising harm, uh, potentially harmful venomous snakes in the rainforest, make sure you jump out of the car with no shoes on. <laughs> 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 But that, that was a gorgeous snake, and I, I got some better pictures of that one later. Um, we were shining eyelash vipers. Eyelash vi pit, pit vipers down in Costa Rica, I don't want to say they're easy, but they're easy. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're pretty common, and if you put the work in, you're going to find them. We found a half dozen, maybe seven, pretty easily. Um, so that was a green one. All right, so that's what I'm talking about with the nighttime is the right time. You get out, you put in your work, you're going to find stuff. That said, lesson 3A is don't discount, discount daylight. Because if you're as obsessed as I am, you can find things during the day. You want to get out early morning. It's, it's, same principles as up here apply there. You just got to look at weather. Uh, get out early morning or dusk or look under things in the shade. You don't want to flip things in the sun. This fairlands was found right on my property in Panama. The best looking fairlands I've seen so far, not that I'm like some fairlands expert or anything, but uh, had a lot of pink in it. Found it laying in the leaves along a path that probably a dozen people walked by that day, just chilling, just relaxing. But I was looking and I found it. Uh, this false fairlands was found before we did night hiking down in Honduras. Of course, lizards, most lizards are easy to see during the day. They're, you know, uh, they're active during the day. It's just getting a picture is sometimes tough or getting a good look if you get too close. One of the things you can do it during the day, which I wasn't aware of until I hired a guide and he said, go flip pond fronds. And you can find snakes. And this was, I'm going to have a lot of blunt headed tree snakes because they're my favorite snake down there. Uh, it was the first cool, different snake I found. I flipped this guy under a pond frond my first full day in Honduras. If you're going to go down there, and I'm hoping that I can inspire you guys to go down there, do not flip pond fronds with your hands. <laughs> it, it's, you just don't want to take a chance with Fairlands. They're found often underneath them, and they are common. It's, you know, it's... What's a pond frond? Uh, when, when a pond, uh, when oh, the palms, palm. yeah, I might have said pond, I don't know. Okay. When the palms fall down, and I mean, you can get piles of them, especially when, like, if you're staying at a hotel, and the maintenance crews like clean them all up, go through them, sift through them. You can yeah. find stuff. We did. We found a lot of stuff. In yeah, them. yeah. I mean, you f a lot of times you just sm find the smaller snakes, but that's fine with me because I mean, stuff I'm not used to seeing up here. Yeah, we found dark frogs, tarantulas, neat things. It's 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 a great way to look, especially during a day or if you don't have, you know, the uh, obsession to stay up all throughout the night. Like I said, of course, lizards, iguanas are easy to find. You can find tree frogs during the day if you try hard enough and check around, you know, the bases of uh, plants, uh, any crevices. Red-eyed leaf frogs are pretty easy to find during the day as well as they are at night. Not too many turtles I come across down there. I don't know if it's because I'm not a turtle guy. I know there's not as many turtle species down there. But we did find this one walking back from the beach our last day in Costa Rica, white lipped mud turtle. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of people on this path. And usually I have more patience and I would wait for it to come out and have a nice picture to share, but no. <laughs> <laughs> um, during the day, there are terrestrial snakes and they have, they have racers down there. They're different genus than ours up here. Uh, that said, they, they act the same. They're fast, they get away until you get them, and then they bite the crap out of you. <laughs> so, along the same lines, of course, uh, crocodiles were awesome. I've been to the EMP down in South Florida with my boys, and I think we saw three of them. 
Uh, there's this one crocodile refuge down along the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. It's actually kind of become like a tourist attraction. Uh, at, it's called Tarcolis Bridge. You can just look off this bridge and there are dozens of crocodiles. So it's a nice, easy, you know, it's kind of a canned experience, but they're wild crocodiles, so counts. <laughs> <laughs> Green vine snake, I found this guy trying to find parrot snakes. Mm -hmm. I put him all the way up there to kind of say, oh, where's the snake at first? Hopefully you didn't catch it in the first half second you looked at it. Just to kind of display how hard these things are to see in the vegetation. So imagine this snake that was maybe this long, just in vegetation everywhere. You gotta get lucky. Um, really cool thing, like I said, one of the biggest targets I had down there were poison frogs. Uh, most of them are diurnal. I don't know if all of them are diurnal or not, but I didn't see any at night. Strawberry blue jean poison frog. This was uh, found in La Fortuna, which is Costa Rica, inland Costa Rica. Um, I had used a guide for this, and he had showed me some. And then after I, I uh, parted ways with him, I had an hour to kill before I told Julie I'd be back. And I decided to check this birding trail out. I know, I'm going to duck in case anybody's going to try. I just decided to check out this birding trail uh, next, right in town. Like, there was, like, La Fortuna is kind of like a small town. It's got a lot of restaurants and hotels, a lot of shops and shopping. And there's bird trails right next to it. And I'm just walking this bird trail looking for stuff. And I cross this creek, and I see all these things hopping around. There must have been, like, seven or eight of them. Right there, like right in the middle of the town. It's just, it's, it's crazy. It's like the things that are common down there are like iconic to, to us. You know, and it's just, it's, it's surreal to be down there. Here's another one I found during the day. I found this by raking leaves, not with my hands, <laughs> but using a, a collapsible snake hook I stuffed into my bag. Wow. Uh, this is a Central American coral snake. That was in Panama. So you gotta be careful with your hands down there. You don't want to get bit by, bit by a coral snake. Another one during the day. This thing was a gem. <laughs> this thing was gorgeous. I, I hate, I mean, I tried to, not to speak camera jargon, but I tried to put my depth of field to a point. If you look closely, there's trash everywhere. Mm -hmm. This thing was amongst all this litter right on the side of the road through La Fortuna. This is a gorgeous animal, you know, just right there. I'm sure they get hit running across that road. Another one we actually failed at during the night with Miguel, the one guy in Costa Rica. I tried again the next day and found a jumping pit viper, which is a, a really nice find for down there. They're, they're apparently pretty hard. That said, he gave me a good spot for them, and I lucked out. I, I, perseverance, you know, go back and try again. I think it was, uh, I skipped a day and found it that morning and checked my time because I have a history of running over here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lesson number four. Animals can be found anywhere, which I've kind of already displayed. This was the landscaping outside of the place we stayed at in Honduras. This gorgeous lodge down there called Pico Benito. Uh, real quick, if any of you uh, now, or 10 or 15 years from now, if any of you ever want any advice on going down there, you know where to find me. Message me, I'll, I'll give you contacts wherever I've been and tell you what I've found there and see if you want to go. This was Pico Benito Lodge in Honduras, a gorgeous, gorgeous place. Um, if you see this vegetation right here, I mean, it looks landscaped, and you think, what am I gonna find here? I can't wait to get out in the rainforest. We got down there at like 6, it got dark at like 6.30 because as you get closer to the equator, at the equator I think it's just 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark. So as you're getting closer, your light's diminishing even in the summer. Um, so it got dark around 6.30, 7 o'clock. So I was, I was like chomping at the bit to get out there. I didn't know any trails through the rainforest. I'm like, I'm just going to take my chances looking around the garden basically. And I found what was probably one of my top five herbs of all three trips down there, this Mexican climbing salamander, right in that foliage I just pointed to, just sitting there on a leaf on a humid night. Uh, the restaurant was right there. I, I think I found it shining while people were eating dinner and they're all wondering what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. um, the, you just got a live stream comment from Barbara Snyder Ferguson that says, hi, mom and dad are watching. <laughs> That's my mother. <laughs> hi, mom. <laughs> Or you take a shot and then you figure out what it is later. 
I do everything I can to cram like a month, month and a half before, and then I just read my field guides like a madman on the plane. A lot of the snakes and stuff I get, it's, it's a lot of the more cryptic animals like the rain frogs that I haven't really um, put into this presentation because they're just a bunch of small brown frogs with, and I, I don't mean to sound jaded because I'm not, I enjoy every species, but they, they're hard to tell. So I usually try to take some pictures, take some belly shots because you think like a perfect field guide picture is going to tell the story and then you talk to an expert it's like, but I needed a back toe shot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's frustrating because I'm a numbers guy and I like stats, so I come home and I want to know how many species I found. And when I have a frog sitting there in my folder on my computer that's never really going to be identified, it just eats at me. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of stuff I don't know. Some of this, like, this stuff's easy to remember. Um, that first night, too, this was a bird eating snake. I uh, found that night and I kept it the next morning because I was excited. It was my first snake of the tropics and I wanted to show it off to everybody. <laughs> this is actually a comp snake. I think Tyler might have uh, commented on this last year saying that you were surprised at how calm it was. So I was just holding it in my hand. There might have been something wrong with this guy. Uh, again, with the uh, herbs can be found anywhere. Geckos everywhere. This is just on the other side of our restaurant window. Um, this was a really nice place I stayed at in Panama. And I, I kind of treated myself and spent a lot of money at this place. And I think the clincher was when I was looking through the website, this is a natural pool that they kind of like um, walled up to create a pool for kids to swim in. But on the website, it had Brad Pitt swinging across on that rope. So I'm like, oh man, I gotta swing on that rope too. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a view from a tree house that's really high up. And I want you to see like, in here they had like scorpion mud turtles and you can always get, I didn't get any parrot snakes, it's still a nemesis of mine, but they say you can get parrot snakes kind of like moving around during the day. That stream there is perfect for glass frogs. Mm -hmm. And I found two different species there, an emerald glass frog and a cascade glass frog. Uh -huh. Numbers, yeah. by the numbers, you just hear them. Uh, uh, people who don't know any better think it's birds like tweeting at night, but it's the frogs calling. So it makes it easy to find. And people, if you, if you don't know why they're called glass frogs, you can see through them. Um, there's one species, I don't know the name off the top of my head, that you can actually watch the heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I haven't found that one yet, but someday. Mm -hmm. uh, Again, iguanas everywhere. Spiny tail iguana, they were all over our place in Hacienda Baru. I had to, <sighs> the kids kept trying to catch them, right? <laughs> and the owner of the place comes up to me, of course, because my kids are always trouble. <laughs> and uh, the boys, girls are perfect, my angels. Um, and he says, you know, one of the guides is telling me that your boys are trying to catch the iguanas. I just want to let you know, my buddy tried to feed, feed one. It bit him, and sure, he had to have like 13 stitches, but the infection almost killed him. He's like, so please tell them to stop trying to grab the iguanas. <laughs> so that, that's a little sub-lesson. Don't grab the iguanas when you're down there. <laughs> uh, really cool frogs. Uh, these smoky jungle frogs, they're huge. They're bigger than our bullfrogs. Uh, they're everywhere down there. Wow. Anywhere there's a water feature. Again, here's another red coffee snake. Easy snake to find at night or by flipping. Uh, here's a tarantula in Honduran curly hair. We found that right outside of our cabin in Honduras uh, underneath some vegetation. And then, like I said, you can see that stuff walking around at night constantly. Hanging out in the hot tub in Costa Rica, Central American. <laughs> These are actually really gorgeous lizards, but I only have my cell phone and I'm like zooming in. So I think it was actually like 20 feet away. And every time I tried to grab it, it just came up empty handed. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on, let me see what here. Okay, yellow tree frogs out, outside the room. You hear them calling from the balcony. Uh, lots of different basilisk uh, species just running around or basking in the sun. I mean, you just walk around and you see all this stuff. It's just, it's great. It's really great. Uh, here's an eyelash pit viper we found behind our room at Costa Rica. I was just out shining right next to the lodge one night. Uh, here's another picture of that fair to lance, an overhead shot to show. I just wanted to show you how gorgeous that thing was. Uh, 
flip the cloudy snail eater right outside of the lodge check-in desk. Wow. So it was funny. I I became the snake guy with the owner down there, and she like kept like tracking me down to see if I had any on me, which I'll get to that in a little bit. Because uh, you know she wanted to, to get guests that are interested, so we ended up spending a lot of time showing off snakes to people, which is actually great because it's nice to you know get people interested. Uh, again, red-eyed tree frogs easily found during the day. The short oh, did I skip? the short-nosed vine snake was found in Costa Rica right outside of the hotel room. We also hiked one up in the rainforest. Uh, things to be found anywhere. One of, the, one of the targets I had down there were spectacle caimans, and I got all these tips on where to go look, and I'm like down by the Panama Canal looking in like the, the creeks that feed into it and stuff, and I'm not finding anything. It's like 92 degrees out in January, and I'm just thinking like, where are these things, right? So I took a break. I went to eat at this restaurant, right, and there was a deck. I sat out on the deck and sweat, and sweat my butt off because I don't have an air conditioning. And I looked down, and there's all these sliders and caimans just hanging out. Of them. So. <laughs> I, I guess people feed them and they're beggars, or you know, they, they throw bread in and it brings the fish up and the caimans grab them or whatever. But that goes hand in hand with herbs can be found anywhere. I found this brown forest turtle walking right outside of our room in the rain. Um, funny thing, uh, you said, do I know what everything is? I didn't know what this was, and looking back, I feel kind of dumb about it, but I thought this was a water turtle like some kind of pond turtle. I have this, this rule that I, I think all of us probably follow. Wherever you find a turtle, you leave it. You don't move it. And it's a good thing because I found this thing walking through the grass by the water, thought it was a pond turtle, thought about putting it in the water, but didn't. Followed my own rule, let it go. Otherwise, I might have drowned the poor thing. But that was a neat find. OK, and I want to make a quick apology on this next lesson. Uh, this is lesson five. I, I kind of kept this note. I, when I was making these lessons, I kind of just labeled them whatever I could come up with at first, and I meant to change this, but I forgot. So lesson five is we have a stick up our butt. <laughs> I meant to say it a little more you know, eloquently. Um, one of the neatest things about going down to the tropics, and for good reason up here, you know, we don't want to hold things overnight. We don't want to disrupt uh, her play, lies, whatever. We definitely don't want to, you know, collect at least where it's illegal. Down there, I, my first trip down there, this great guy, James Adams, who runs Pico Benito, I said to him, I said, James, what is the rule down here? Because I've seen people that are obviously finding things at night in these gorgeous daylight shots. What is the rule? He said, there's two rules. Return the animal where you got it and don't get bit. So that said, I would hold a lot of things so I could get some daylight shots and have some different looking things. So these, this next set of pictures, I'm going to start rushing because I'm starting to run late, um, are all things I held the night before. And Lots of pillowcases and containers. Yeah, my, my room was filled Lots. with pillowcases yes, and containers. <laughs> Everything was returned unharmed. Uh, you know, that's debatable, and you got to follow your own ethical guidelines here. But down there, nobody cares. Because a lot of these, a lot of these people are eating the things. Mm -hmm. They really are. I mean, so uh, they're survivors down there. They they find iguanas. It, it's sad. Oh, I'm not going to get into it. It's sad what they do to the animals. But when you got to survive, you got to feed your family. You got to do what you got to do. So that said, it's not a big deal down there. So this is a northern cat-eyed snake. This gorgeous litter toad we found one night. I'm going to rush through these. Um, I was actually road cruising in Panama and found this orange-bellied litter snake, and there was a car behind me, so there I am stuffing it in my camera bag like some kind of poacher. <laughs> you know? um, and here's my glamour shot from the next day, so I can show off both sides of it, both colors. Uh, turnip tail gecko, you're probably never going to find at night, so I got a nice daylight shot of that. This stockhead snake we cruised during the night in Costa Rica. I don't know what it was doing with its mouth, because the thing was basically like a worm snake. Mm -hmm. and didn't open its mouth until I had it out during the day. Maybe mm -hmm. it was stressed, I don't know. But I let him go right where I uh, found him the night before, the next night when I rode cruised. Uh, it was cool to bring back this nocturnal, tailless whip scorpion and put 
an ugly creature on a pretty flower. I like the contrast there, and it's just, it, you get to show the detail so much better in daylight. These tropical sea snakes are basically um, Latin America's water snakes, except they don't bite the crap out of you whenever you give them a dirty look. <laughs> this guy was basically, and we found a few of these basically swimming across the road on the rainy nights. A neat thing, I'm sorry, this is a bird. Uh, in the restaurant, a lot of the hummingbirds and stuff get stuck in there and kind of get tired out and just sit on the windowsills. So they were kind of letting me, which I'm just a hotel guest, you know, take the birds and, and let them go and get close looks. So that was a really neat opportunity that you really wouldn't get up here. This next slide, I apologize, this is the only captive animal I included, but I included it because it's such a cool snake and it kind of goes to show you uh, how they're a little um, more easy going down there. They had a captive neotropical rattlesnake and they were showing me some of their captives. I'm like, can I take a picture of that? I'm like, sure, go ahead. So we hooked this rattlesnake. I mean, up here you'd have to sign liability waivers or they just tell you to get lost. You know, so that was really cool. Uh, this green iguana we saved overnight. This was funny. Um, I don't know if you can tell from the picture, but his arms kind of tucked back that way because every time I'd go to let him go, he'd go to run. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of had to hold him and take a <laughs> So this was actually taken poolside in Hacienda Baru with a bunch of people hanging out at the pool. Nobody really noticed what was going on. They're all enjoying their drinks and swimming, right? So then, after I got my shot that I was happy with, I'm like, all right, guys, just let him go. We let the thing go. It takes off, tail up in the air, dives into the pool, and starts swimming underneath. Uh, all of my kids jump in, and it's this big chaotic scene. Everybody's like up in arms about this iguana swimming through the pool. They end up grabbing it, and we let it go safely. <laughs> While I take a drink, um, this is the eyelash viper that we rode cruise. I only found one yellow. Most of them were some kind of green color. Um, this wasn't a striking picture or anything. Apparently, sometimes it just gape like a rat snake would or like a cottonmouth would as like a, a defense type thing. Isn't that what they do whenever they see a legend? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Um, gorgeous, gorgeous helmeted iguana, helmeted basilisk, they have different names. If you're going down there, if you have it in you, learn, learn the taxonomical names because you'll find that every snake with any sort of red or orange coloring down there is a coral snake. And that's just not the case. Every snake that's climbing is a vine snake. So when I was down there with, you know, my bilingual guides, it was really helpful to know the tax taxonomical name because I could be like, he might call a, um, he, he'd call everything that climbed a vine snake, so it was easy to say Oxybelus or Leptodera, I think, I'm kind of out of practice, I think that's the uh, cat-eyed snake, so that's really helpful. All right, this next one, I'm going to show you this cloudy snail eater. There's a story behind this one, and thanks to them not being uptight down there, this um, idea I had finally came to fruition a year later. When we were down in Honduras, uh, Julie would be working on her laptop back at the hotel where they had Wi-Fi, and I'd be off gallivanting in the rainforest, finding stuff, bringing stuff back to her here, check this snake out, check this tarantula out, whatever. Um, I think she was more interested in snakes. But I would bring back blunt-headed tree snakes, and I think that ended up being your favorite yeah. snake. I mean, they're, they're just so cool. They're easy to hold, whatever. So. I was thinking about proposing to her eventually um, when the time was right and I had this idea that, all right, well, she's cool with this. Like sometimes when I'll show her a snake, she's hesitant at first. I now know that she likes blunt-headed tree snakes. So my idea was to hand over a snake with a ring around it and blunt-headed tree snakes worked perfectly because they curl up, I'm not going to lose thousands of dollars out of the ring. <laughs> So when I took the kid, I, I told the kids, look, this is my plan. I told them the day before we left. I said, we are going to stay out until we find a blind headed tree snake. Yeah. We cruised a few dead ones, but we did cruise cloudy snail eaters by the dozen, uh, which kind of acted the same. So that was what I deemed my proposal snake. And when I proposed to her in Costa Rica, <laughs> I gave her some speech and I'm all nervous, probably more nervous than I am up here when I first started. And I'm like probably going back and forth. And in my pocket, I had this clay snail eater curled up 
with a ring wrapped around it, and I proposed, and there is her hand with the snake and the ring. <laughs> and here is our engagement picture. <laughs> That's Joel. That's my one guy with the vine snake. And Julia, I don't know what that picture was about. Here we are. That's our view from Iron Owl Lodge with the volcano in the back of us. Gorgeous, gorgeous place. So that's that story. Lesson six, be adventurous. There's a few reasons I want to talk about this. You don't want to miss out. You don't want to be herp, herp, herp the whole time you're down there. There's things that I kind of blew off like, oh, every place we go has got zip lining. I don't want to zip line. You know, it's, it's, I get like hipster about it. But it's fun, and it was a great time. And it does help find you herps. Because Baby Fairlands was literally right next to the first platform we started at on the zip line course. I know a lot of people enjoy beer, so the adventures, every country you go to has got their own special beer, kind of like we'd have like Yingling Lager here. It's like, yo, you have to have a Balboa, or you have to have an Imperial, whatever. I'm not a beer drinker, but when in Rome, <laughs> or when in Latin America. Uh, you can see some gorgeous places like Manuel Antonio, that's my daughter Lily, and you can find herps there. I mean, we found lots of mammals there. There was iguanas on the beach. I mean, if that's what you're down there for, you can find it anywhere. By being adventurous, I went down this, this uh, road and found this secluded beach. It was just gorgeous. I had the place to myself, but I was by myself, so it's not like I laid out and sunbathed or anything. <laughs> Another thing I didn't want to do, probably because I broke a rib the day before I went down there thinking I was cool riding my stepson's hoverboard, um, <laughs> I was horseback riding. But I did it, and it was probably one of the funnest things I ever did because getting back to them not being so uptight, they really should have had us sign some liability waivers. I mean, <laughs> Rebecca, at one point, I hear her scream, I look back, she's side riding the horse <laughs> and ends up hitting the deck. But anyway, one of the good reasons for this was it put us into areas of the resort or their land that I never would have seen otherwise. And I found some really cool ponds and found hourglass uh, tree frogs breeding dozens of them. Another reason to be adventurous, you'd meet some awesome people like this guy, Jack Ewing, who's been down in Costa Rica for 40 years and he's been working down there tirelessly to to create wildlife corridors and kind of reconnect these fragmented areas of habitat so that his, his focus is to peers, I think that's how you pronounce it, so they can travel and repopulate areas. But, you know, uh, habitat conservation and saving land, that's good for everything, right? So, or you can meet guys like this awesome guy, Ivan, who ran this $45 a night bed and breakfast in the canal zone and is sitting there pounding on my door because he just heard a spectacle bow down the street. Like, and they just help you find stuff. Wow. Um, so don't, don't, don't blow off other ideas. Without snorkeling in Mikayos Conchinos, I never would have made it to that island where I found all those boas. And then you also want to be a little careful because uh, the, our one guy took us on this crazy, crazy concrete wall mm -hmm. where there was like a 40, 50 foot drop on the one side mm -hmm. nice. and mountain on the other. And it was probably the craziest thing I've ever done. <laughs> Julie has this blue morpho or blue, yeah, blue morpho butterfly coming at us and when you catch it with the flashlight, it like mesmerizes you and she almost died. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, uh, like literally, thankfully she fell on the right side. Wow. Um, so you do want to be careful, but do be adventurous. The craziest rainstorm ever down there flooded my kid's room. There was landslides everywhere. That said, I only have so long in Costa Rica. I went out road cruising and had a great night. <laughs> <laughs> um, this next lesson is lesson seven. Uh, this is just a little bit more of a serious note real quick. I didn't really know where to put this in, but I did want to touch on it. Um, one of the best reasons and one of the reasons I wanted to get my kids down there so badly was we take for granted what we have up here. There's a whole world out there and I really think it helps to go see such poverty firsthand and realize how well you have it. The majority of the population in the world lives on $2 a day and I mean that house there is a nice house. There's communities down there of hundreds of people like a big neighborhood would be up here, 
where we built better forts as kids. It's like whatever they can find, they are stacking up against their wall or they're throwing cinder blocks on top of some tin to keep themselves from getting wet while they sleep on their dirt floors down there. So uh, I would implore you to get out of your comfort zone and get into some poor areas of the world at some point in your life so that you can you know, stop taking things for granted, uh, see a bigger picture, um, you know, see how other people are living. Uh, a neat, neat, weird, but neat thing down there is everybody carries around machetes. Uh, <laughs> like, we're all walking around with our cell phones. Everybody down there's got a machete, and they just chop stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's, I mean, these ladies were working out in the field, but, like, people are, are literally walking down the road with machetes in their hand. It's, um, a lot of, I just, I just threw some pictures in here. This is a local market. Uh, this is Panama City from Plain, kind of neat. It's a third world country with a first world city. Mm -hmm. So you have all these like gorgeous skyscrapers and stuff, if you want to call them gorgeous. But then you're like, as soon as you turn off the highway, you're hitting dirt road into like just people living in shanties, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, hit a traffic jam here in Honduras. <laughs> but, um, this was a school that taught kids till sixth to eighth grade, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. And it's just an open air thing with basically they're in a cage uh, sitting on benches. And it just it really goes a long way with showing you how entitled we are and how good we have it here. And it really makes you take a step back. Um, you know, the, the towns are just, they're, they're something to see. You got kids just begging at cars. And our, our one guy, he was so proud uh, we were driving through a town near his community, and um, he said, hey, look, Bob, we got a famous restaurant here, and it was a KFC. Mm -hmm. It was like the only thing familiar that I'd mm -hmm. seen down in Honduras, and he was so happy that there was a KFC there, you know? Mm -hmm. So I apologize for being a downer. I did want to touch on that real quick, um, pick it up a little bit. I'm not sure if I should have went into this lesson, but I'll try and rush through it. I apologize for the bird. <laughs> I'll get quick. There is more to life than hers, okay? That doesn't mean you need to go down there, but what I'm trying to say is things that are iconic and things that you think just don't really exist, when you're down there and you see them, it's amazing. This red cap mannequin, these guys do these crazy dances on branches that are insane to attract the females. Mammals are simple down there. Mm -hmm. You might get a, a shot at like seeing a bat flying around at dusk or whatever. Everywhere you look, if you're looking underneath something, you're finding bats down there. Mm -hmm. It's just easy. Monkeys kind of freak me out. Uh. But they're, they're easy to find. It was weird though, because as I'm taking pictures of these things in the trees, they're looking back at me and I'm like, dude, is this a human like staring back at me? Like, what, the, what are you doing, you know? It's, mm -hmm. But monkeys everywhere, it's just surreal. Hummingbirds, if you're not a birder, you probably see a hummingbird every now and then. I know before I birded, I never saw hummingbirds, like maybe twice in my life. Uh, you'll have hummingbirds coming up and basically challenging you if you're too close to the feeder down there, like just floating right in front of your face. They're just everywhere. Uh, the tanagers are amazing. Just, I mean, you might not like birds, but just look at those colors. It's like a rainbow on a bird, just hanging out in trees. Uh, there's great patoo at night, tons of owls at night. Um, that thing was like hanging out with a ghost up on this deck. White-nosed coatis, they're running around like raccoons that are up here. Uh, some more color for you. Insects are amazing. We found this guy just sleeping. Um, one of my favorite bird groups are trogans. It's violaceous trogan was just hanging out by a restaurant one day. It's collared arasari, which is a type of toucan. I mean, just it's stuff that you really don't think exists until you go down. These capuchins were everywhere on the beach. Um, they learned how to use people as a food source and worked as teens. They would like, you would have one like come try to grab your food so you're kind of like swatting away at it. While you're swatting away at it, you got your, your bar, the other one jumps and grabs it. And we really, really neat to see. Unfortunate, but neat to see. I mean, it is what it is. Uh, when you can just hear squawking overhead and look up and there's just parrots, like these pet store animals just flying around like it's nothing. I mean, uh, by the dozens. Two cans, like, I I thought that was just a Fruit Loops thing, you know? <laughs> and they're like landing outside of our hotel rooms. It's just, it's, it's surreal. I don't really have any other way to explain it. Owls, 
Uh, you hear them constantly. <coughs> Finding them is a different story, but if you put enough effort into it, they're a lot easier to find down there. My number one target for Costa Rica, even more than herps, I hate to say it, were sloths. I mean, and we saw tons of sloths. We probably saw like 14, 15 sloths down there, two-toed and three-toed, but this two-toed mama with a baby was right near us, so I took a picture. While I was looking at those crocodiles on that, on that bridge, <coughs> scarlet macaws flying by, pairs at a time. It was just, it was amazing. So that's my little, you know, there is more life than herbs. I'm not saying you have to go down there for the birds, but you know, take some time to appreciate them because it, it's pretty amazing and it's something that you're never going to see up here outside the pet shop. All right, two more lessons. I'll try to be quick. All right, don't take anything lightly. And what I mean by that is venomous snakes. When I went down there, I um, I basically, oh, what I do? I basically went down there and had this rule of mine that said, you know what a pit viper looks like, you know what a coral snake looks like. Don't get bit by them. Anything else, you know, it's probably rear fang, fang but how bad can it hurt, <laughs> right? So, Julie carried around the Muserana, rear, rear fang. She probably shouldn't have did that, so don't call her a bad example. <laughs> Actually, no, these things never bite. They are rear fang, but they never bite. Um, this was something I should have done. I showed you this guy earlier, uh, a false fairlands. These, actually, these guys actually have a pretty um, harmful bite. I mean, they're not going to kill you. You're not going to lose a finger or anything, but they can put a good wallop on you. And they are actually pretty bitey, and I didn't know it ahead of time, so I got lucky. You can see a racer bite right on my palm there. <laughs> Racers are fine. They're harmless. All they do is draw a little bit of blood. Um, Here's the lesson I wanted to, that I learned the hard way. We were going up this hill and there were glass frogs at the top of it. And it's my first trip and glass frog was high on my list. And we were finding snakes, we were finding tarantulas, we were finding all kinds of things. I found this Kamiathani bipunctatus, which I believe is called a two-spotted snake. Um, I kind of got familiar with the taxonomy because I'd asked so many questions about it because I was trying to pose it, and it just was being very, um, it, it just wasn't cooperating. And Julie said, why don't you just carry it with you for a while, and you know, we'll keep looking for things. So, you know, I trust in her judgment. <laughs> <laughs> so I carry it, and I'm just kind of working with it, trying to like, once it curls up into a ball, I'm gonna put it down. You know, if you've ever posed a snake, you know how it works. So I'm just walking for a while, and then I think, I, I'm, not, I'm walking in the dark, and then I feel a bite in me, right? So I shine my light on it, and I'm like, hey, look at this thing, it's biting me, right? No big deal. It's just kind of going back and forth, rocking its mouth. Oh. And then as it's rocking, I see there's rear fangs, I'm like, hmm. Oh. So I kind of get a little tug, and it's not letting go, and I'm not going to harm the snake, and it's not letting go, and it rocks again, and I'm like, ooh. And it rocks and it keeps on rocking. And every time it rocked that rear fang in on each side, my hand started to catch fire. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a wuss, but it hurt. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it burned. And I, I let it go. I took a quick picture. Meanwhile, my hand's on fire. I'm playing it cool. We're with, I'm with Julie. I'm with a guide. And I'm with one of the owners of the resort I'm at. And I'm playing it cool. And I'm just like thinking, oh, man, there's something definitely I'm starting to get like lightheaded, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking like, okay, I know it's rear fang. It's not medically significant. I don't need to be to a hospital, but why am I getting lightheaded? Am I having an allergic reaction? I'm staying quiet because I want my glass frogs at the top of that hill. <laughs> so I basically, you know, I didn't want to say risk my life, but I took a chance because I needed to see the glass frogs. <laughs> it actually swelled my hand up for six weeks. My hand did not go down, so that's my normal hand. You see my knuckles disappear, and it got worse. That's the, that's the morning after. You see a little bit of the bites. No big deal, you know, just these tiny little teeth. But, I mean, my hand was basically useless for two weeks and swollen for six. So don't take anything lightly down there like I did. Um, you know, I don't know if there's any tarantulas that are going to hurt you too bad, but I, it, without the knowledge, don't take the chance. I brought the scorpion back. It turns out that this scorpion was a big deal. And I got lucky that I didn't get tagged by this thing. Mm -hmm. There was like a few, it, it was in the same genus as this one that can kill you. Mm -hmm. This one wasn't it, but it could still put you in the hospital. So, you know, 
don't take a laissez-faire attitude with this stuff. Especially here. I was taking pictures of insects, and this is just a cell phone shot, um, to kind of identify later. And this ended up being a Brazilian wandering spider about two inches from my hand. Um, apparently these guys are pretty aggressive. And apparently if you get bit, um, I don't know what I want to say here with kids. Um, it can make you, after being the best lover of your life for a few <laughs> hours, it can cause lifelong impotence in males, <laughs> lifelong impotence getting bit by one of these things. Nice. So, luckily I dodged a bullet there, and you know, thankfully I, I have that lesson learned and not a more severe one. <laughs> Last lesson, it's 8.44, I got a few minutes, am I good? Mm -hmm. Last lesson, always be prepared. This was a big regret because I saw a gorgeous coral snake down in Honduras get away from me because I was not ready with my hook mm. and I wasn't going to take the chance of tailing a coral snake when it's wrapped up in the vegetation, whatever. Here's an instance, and I, just, I apologize for another bird photo, but I have my camera ready there and apparently nobody gets keelbilled two cans in flight, so you know that made a few people jealous because I was prepared. Wow. Uh, because I was ready, I got to watch this hog island boa sit in, you know, preparation to tag something as it crossed, and mm. we didn't have enough time to wait for that something to happen, but I was prepared. Because I was prepared, our one night in Costa Rica, mm. we found this Costa Rican coral snake envenomating a red coffee snake. And it was just something to behold. And we just, mm. we were, I was able to get close. You know, coral snakes are definitely, definitely something you don't want to take a chance with. You don't want to get bit by them. They're, you know, neurologic. You're going to start slurring your speech, drooling. You know, it's not going to be a good thing. So it was a really good opportunity to view this up close without, you know, any danger. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. So it's a good thing you're prepared when a wild cat walks by. Oh, yeah. um, and that's a lie because I've never seen a wild cat. This was actually an orphan <laughs> that hung out with us while we ate dinner. Oh. And it was just awesome at this one resort. And as you can see, it, oh. it didn't enjoy me as much as I enjoyed it. Um, it. It actually bit, I mean, it didn't hurt, but it hurt. It didn't, bit, it didn't bite to hurt you, but the teeth were nothing to be messed with. Uh, I haven't been lucky enough to see a wild cat yet. They avoid people. Mm -hmm but hopefully I will be prepared when that happens one day. All right, this last quick story I want to share about what happens when you aren't prepared. Um, one of my big, my, my number one mammal goal down in Panama was a Jeffrey's tamarind because their, their um, range is so restricted. So I knew if I did, it's like, okay, if I don't see a coral snake, they're all over all the countries down there. I can see a coral snake the next time I go down. But I knew uh, I only had this one shot to see his Jeffrey's hammer unless I went back to the canal zone of Panama. Um, so the last day I was there, I'm walking down towards this place. I got a tip off on where some green and black poison dart frogs would be. And I hear this screaming, which I'd already did the research with, to listen with my ears. And I'm like, that sounds like a tamarind. So I have my 100 millimeter lens on because I'm looking for dart frogs. I go run up the street about a quarter mile, and I see these tamarinds. I take a picture with a hundred millimeter, right? Okay, it's an okay shot. I could have definitely did better with my 600 millimeter. I could have had some nice shots of the face, whatever. Regardless, I saw my number one mammal goal. It was great. But I take off, running back down to my car to grab my long lens, book it all the way back up the hill. This is like 90 degrees in Panama in January, and they're gone. Mm -hmm. So I walk back all deflated, right? I walk by this creek where the uh, dark frogs are supposed to be hanging out, and I see a green and black dark frog. That was like my number one amphibian goal down there. At this point, I should have had my 100 millimeter in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, I had my 609 pound lens on, trying to keep it still, and trying to get a shot because it's right next to the creek, mm -hmm. and there's rocks there, and I just wanted to get a shot. And this is the shot I'm most unproud of in my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> so, I, it just made me sick to come back with that thing. I mean, it, it hardly even had any green on it, right? Mm -hmm. So, 
I decide, all right, I'm going to walk this creek after digging through these rocks and, and just basically, I, I might have shed a tear or two. I decide, all right, I'm just going to pull, I'm, I'm by myself, I'm pulling my uh, shorts up to my thighs, looking like an idiot, uh, to the tamarinds anyway. And I walk down this creek, I donated my sneakers to the nearest trash receptacle, and I'm walking in this nasty creek with water up to here, just checking the edges, right, looking for dart bugs. Never saw another one, right? So that was me not being prepared. Uh, long story short, I had to be at the airport in an hour, and I apologize to whoever I sat next to on the plane home, because running back and forth to 90 degrees and then walking around in creek water and jumping on a plane probably wasn't not, not too pleasant to them. <laughs> um, thank God I got back to the tropics six months later because that was eating at me, and I finally got redemption and got green and black poison frogs um, in Costa Rica by the dozen. I think I saw like 18 of them. Um, so if there's anything I'd like you guys to take away from this, I waited till I was 38 to go down and do something that I basically wanted to do all of my life. And I really wish I didn't wait as long because I missed out on a lot. I, I actually hurt an area where golden toads once hopped in Panama, mm -hmm. and they are now extinct in the wild. They're no longer there. I mean, if you have the means or if you can make the means to go down or go wherever, whether it's Australia or Asia or whatever, do it. Don't wait like me because there's a good chance that that stuff is not going to be there by the time you do. Uh, things are disappearing left and right, and I hope that I uh, inspired you guys to take a trip to wherever it may be, whether it's the tropics or wherever, and uh, get on it. Don't wait as long as I did. Thanks, guys. Any questions? <laughs>
the adventure of like, am I going to survive in this foreign country where I don't know their language, you know? <laughs> and I'm going to drive this car around. And I, I have one spot like three hours out mm -hmm. in the rainforest, you know? And that was the fun part, actually. I mean, it it t definitely takes an adventurous spirit to do it. But the people, there is crime, but the people are so friendly. Mm -hmm. Everybody's friendly, and I think it's because. They don't have what we have. They don't take things for granted. I, you know, I was, you know, if somebody brought me a snake, I'd tip them like five bucks, and that's like three days' pay for some of them, you know? It's, to me, it's nothing. I mean, I paid thousands of dollars on plane tickets to get down there. I can throw you a five, it's win win. You know, you're showing yeah. me a snake I wouldn't have seen otherwise. It's great. Yeah. Um, a lot of people get turned off, especially in places like Honduras, because Honduras is the murder, ca murder capital of the world, and it's not even close. Like, you look at Wikipedia, and you look at like a bar chart, you got like Honduras up here, and the second one's like all the way down here. That said, a lot of people, when I first went down, were like, oh, aren't you scared? You're gonna get, you're gonna get you know, robbed, and this and that. So I said to James, who was a great person to have as a contact down there, I said, look, I'm so tired of feeling the questions about this, oh, you're gonna get murdered, you're gonna get, you're gonna get, you know, trafficked or whatever. Not maybe yeah, not trafficked. Maybe, maybe <laughs> you know, um, you know, but um, human trafficking is it is a thing. But he said, you know, all the crime down here is the bad people doing it to bad people. Yeah. As you have like Central America going up into that small bit, all the drugs and stuff coming from South America mm -hmm. funnel, and it just it all condenses. So you have all that crime in one area. And it's in the cities. Any of us going down for wildlife are not going to be herping the streets of San Pedro Sula at night. So, you know, you fly in, you get out, you're fine. Um, and he actually made a good point. He said, you know, we have the crime down here, but those of us down here that are lucky enough to be able to afford a TV, we look at the news and we're like, what the hell's going on up in America? <laughs> you have these school shootings, you know, you have, you have all these, these terrorist attacks, like, it's all the, like people are scared of down here because they're not used to it. it it's just, it's, it's fear of the unknown. When, when we're down here looking at what's going up, on up in your country and it's, it's the same way. But you get up there and you know, it's, it's not everywhere. I think they still have tickets. I know I was, there's two examples. I was in the Bahamas and Nassau Island and I just walked through the island, through the towns and stuff like that. Everybody was really cool. And then I went to the Yucatan, and all anybody told me while I was down there is you do not leave the compound alone. Yeah. You have a guy, you have a driver, you do not leave here alone. And it's kind of one of those things that makes you think. Yeah, and I think it, I think that's on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think now that I've had a little bit of experience, I probably could do Honduras by myself. Thank God I didn't, because the first time, like, there's, there's no rules down there. Just even driving would have been crazy. Like, when I tell you, I mean, people go around constantly and try to beat the oncoming traffic. We saw families of four on multiple, multiple occasions on a dirt bike. Kids sandwiched in between the parents. Like, I don't even know how they fit on these dirt bikes. Like, there's no rules at all. There's like people driving, like 12 people in the back of this banana truck with a horse in there with them. It's just like, you know, so, I would definitely, you know, be more careful, maybe get one under your belt. That was why we kind of went down to kind of see what it was like at first before I took the whole family down. And I didn't want it to be, you know, an exploratory visit with my kids not knowing what to expect. Um, yeah, so, but don't, don't let that deter you. It's, it's a wonderful place with wonderful people. I, it's, it's worthwhile for more than just the animals. The culture, the environment, the habitat, just experiencing a different part of the world that's so different. Just get down there. Yeah, when I was down in Costa Rica, I had to take a couple buses places, like longer places, and I was just showing people pictures of the herbs on my camera, and like I didn't speak much Spanish at all, and I was just making friends, and they were helping me change buses and stuff like that. I didn't get traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're still here. Um, yeah, I mean, it's great. Friendly people. Yeah. Maybe I don't remember it, but as a, as a you know, old anthropologist guy, did you see any of those things? We did not. Really? Yeah. Wow. Apparently, they're really hard in Costa Rica. Um, I mean, I didn't have any leads in Panama. I, I guess I could have flipped one or found one crawling at night. Honduras, they do see them a lot on the lodge. I just didn't luck out. 
And I, I actually, it was my first trip. I think I've gotten better. I've gotten more of a search image. Maybe if I went back now, I'd have a little more luck. Actually, I think if I went back now, I'd probably do better with everything. Sure. Because it does take some experience. Yes? What did, what did you do to prevent any potential spread of disease from one site to another? For example, did you sanitize your equipment between sites? <laughs> no. no. I, um, I, I took down a lot of different Rubbermaid containers. Like, I, I probably took down like 16 different Rubbermaid containers and I never mixed anything. Other than that, I, I wasn't in water. Like, I didn't have to do anything to boots or anything. Um, basically, that's it. I, I, I never mixed anything. I guess, I guess potentially, you know, if I touched a frog and it had chytrid or something, I could have, I could have spread it to something. But well, soil has chytrid too. Well, yeah, I mean, at that point, and I don't, I don't mean to sound like, like I don't care, but like honestly, it could happen anywhere. Like even when we're road crew, like if I road cruise down in Del Marva. And I know there's pools down there that are full of chytrid. You have a barking tree frog jumping across the road. You can apparently pick that up on your tire treads and spread it that way. So, I mean, there is a point where I just kind of got to, like, let it go. I mean, the, the only way to, to not have a mark on anything is to basically stay holed up in your house and never go outside. I mean, you can take better precautions. That, but that's what I did. I just made sure I didn't mix any animal with another animal. So long as you're not hurting for fun. What? Well, yes. <laughs> you don't hurt for fun. <laughs> so. Anything else? I appreciate it, guys. I love uh, coming here to talk. It's a lot of fun. I have some calendars over there if you want to check it out. At least grab a flyer. Um, I'm going to start pushing these things online coming up in the next month. Last year I sold 265 of these things and was able to donate $1,500 to Panthera down in the tropics. Don't know, um, I don't know what, what uh, charity I'm going with. I just love the, the work they were doing with, with basically habitat preservation. And it's good for everything. You know, I'm, I'm not like some kind of uh, big cat aficionado, but when you protect the land, you protect it for everything. So that's why I gave it to them. Year before I gave $1,000 to uh, uh, Matt Cat, who does bog turtle surveys a lot right here in Lancaster and Chester and all. Um, so I guess they paid their employees to go move, clear some stuff out or whatever they did with it. You know, so it's just a fun thing. It's win-win. It's a physical product. A lot of people like to give them away for gifts. And I just put them together, put my pictures to good use, and give the proceeds to conservation, some money that I wouldn't have otherwise. So, you know, check them out. Not to buy anything. Tonight, but at least grab a flyer so you know where to where to find me if anybody is interested as Christmas is coming up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, hey guys, Dave, not the president. He just.